The NYPD is issuing gun permits at an even lower rate than it did before the Supreme Court's Bruin decision. Plus, Reason Magazine's J.D. Tuchili on a study showing some Americans are reluctant to tell pollsters they own a gun. That and more on this episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. No, the devil's got no All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Gutowski. I'm also the founder of TheReload.com, where you can head over and sign up for our free weekly newsletter right now if you want to keep up to date with what's going on with guns in America. Just one email a week to give you all the biggest stories to keep you ahead of the curve, get you the stuff that isn't covered widely elsewhere. But this week, we are going to focus on a particular study. We did a study last week. There's another interesting study I think we could talk about this week, which showed that perhaps gun owners are reluctant to tell researchers and pollsters that they, in fact, own a firearm. And there's a lot of interesting little bits to discuss within that study. And so I wanted to have someone on who has a good grasp of this, whose piece on the study I thought was was quite insightful and impressive. And that is uh, Reason Contributing Editor J.D. Tuchel, you know, I we talked about your name immediately before I started recording. I said, that's a name I can pronounce because last week I had a, a Scandinavian guest that was even harder. And then, I'm, of course, immediately I, I screwed up. So can you, J.D., just give people uh, the actual pronunciation of your name and then a little bit more about yourself? Sure enough. My name is J.D. Tuchelli. I'm a contributing editor at Reason Magazine. Um, I've been doing this for a number of years. I used to be a managing editor there and, uh, I moved on from having to manage people. And now I just put words on paper, which is something I very much enjoy doing across a range of topics. And one of those topics obviously is firearms and firearms policy, which is what we're discussing today. Yes. And, uh, and you've written a bit about firearms recently. And so I've I've noticed uh, that and really enjoyed the pieces you've written. So I wanted to to have you on and, and yeah, it wasn't even a hard name to pronounce. I just psyched myself out immediately. But um, you wrote a piece on this study. Uh, can Why don't you, because uh, I actually think you have a little bit better of a grasp of it than, than I do. But we wrote a piece on it as well. I think we mentioned it briefly on a previous podcast, but I think there's enough here to do a whole episode on. And can you just explain the basics of what these researchers found? Absolutely. Uh, a little bit of background on it is that a lot of gun policy and gun policy research is premised on the idea that we know how prevalent firearms ownership is in the United States, roughly how many gun owners there are and how many guns there are. That's not necessarily true, even though it's a widespread assumption. And delving into the how true is it element was uh, the basis of, the, of this particular study. It comes out of the uh, New Jersey Gun Violence Research Center at Rutgers University. They surveyed 3,500 people. And what they wanted to see was how truthful are people being when they ask them, do you own a gun? And they broke the group down, not just demographically, but in terms of the responses, into about roughly 1,200 people who said, yes, I'm a gun owner. Then they came up with the rest who said, no, I don't own a gun. And what they did was that they took common responses to a variety of questions about attitudes and policies that you could apply across the group that admitted to owning firearms. And they said, OK, let's look at the non-gun owners and let's see if we can apply these to them and find out if there are people who said they're not gun owners who actually look more like gun owners. And they did. And they came up with the idea that depending upon the level of probability, that is how certain you are about your analysis, anywhere between 220 and a little over a thousand of the respondents who said they did not own guns almost certainly did. And that's absolutely fascinating to look at, troubling for the researchers, which they went into over and over again in their paper, but it has huge implications for policy, has huge implications for lawmaking, And also for how accurate gun research is across the United States, because if people are lying about who they are and what their status is with regard to guns, it means the researchers don't know as much as they think they do. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that sums it up pretty well as far as the why this matters, right? Why people should care, because it's actually, you know, there was some talk about this when it came out. You know, it, it sort of reinforces this idea that you've seen in the, the gun rights movement or among gun owners for a long time that basically polling on how many people own guns is 
not accurate because people don't trust pollsters and they won't tell them that they own guns. You know, oh, I lost my guns in the boating accident. This is a common, super common line that you hear. Um, and, and so people looked at that as, uh, well, all right, here's evidence that this is true. This thing we've been saying for a long time is true. But, but I think it goes way beyond just that. You know, there's a lot more to suss out as far as the impact of this particular study. There's, there's a lot to it. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. I, I spoke with Alison Bond. She's the lead researcher for this paper. Um, and, and, you know, we did a piece where I interviewed her and we talked about the results. And you know, she was describing how this came about. Right. Because, uh, you know, you mentioned there how they did the study. But it turned out that they they, they were already doing this questionnaire. This was, was already happening. This happened in 2020. Um, and, and it wasn't like they didn't um, they didn't request this survey to be done for this study. They were already doing a, this survey for you know different research purpose. And then they one of the questions they asked is whether people were going to. And they found the typical range that you would get from most major public polling, which is about a third of people said that they personally owned a gun. Um, but they then heard of research in uh, with veterans, actually, on whether somebody is uh, having suicidal ideation or has ever had suicidal ideation. And uh, there was there had been research done that showed some veterans or military members were perhaps withholding this, uh, the, you know, they wouldn't identify that they'd had these thoughts. And there was research done to try and figure out how many people perhaps were, were withholding in that way and using the same sort of method that you just described there. And so that they thought, well, why don't we do that? with gun owners um, and try to get an idea of how many people are holding back whether or not they own guns from researchers. And then these were the conclusions they came to. And yeah, like you said, there's there's quite a lot of implications for, I mean, just so wide ranging, you know, I, what do you think is going to be perhaps the most important one uh, area to focus on with the, the outcome of this study? Well, there are, there's actually a lot of import to this. It's it's a pretty big deal uh, if you find out that your research is into the prevalence of any major social phenomenon is not accurate. One of the bigger implications, though, is that lawmaking in this country, and we have a deeply polarized country, a lot of lawmaking, frankly, has come to be uh, punitive. That is, people sponsor laws not necessarily because they want to achieve a policy goal, policy goal or stamp out a social ill, but because they want to punish a segment of the population that they don't perceive as the part of their political base. And if an activity or a, um, a product or a service is associated with an ideological or a partisan affiliation, it's easy to punish people of that ideological partisan affiliation, which would be unconstitutional in itself, by going after the activity, good or service instead. So. One way of, of punishing, say, if you're conservatives, if you're on the left, is to go after firearms. Um, conservatives might go after Teslas if they want to publish, you know, punish liberals. The same idea. So there's a big implications here, but that only works if it's true. If gun ownership is really something that could be associated with those on the political right. We've seen a lot of changes in that in recent years. We know there was a surge in gun purchases um, occur, you know, in recent years because of social dis, uh, disorder, because of the pandemic, because of perceptions, the country's kind of com coming apart at the seams. A lot of the new buyers have been women. A lot of them have been people of color, um, urban African-Americans in particular. And this study... One of the things they found was that almost half of those they identified as saying that they did not own a firearm, but were likely actual firearm owners who were responding falsely, were uh, unmarried women of color living in cities. And that's exactly who you would identify as among the, the surge of new gun owners, people who are characteristic of those who were not traditionally seen as being firearms friendly, but as gun ownership spreads across the population, um, have joined their ranks. And that means that it's no longer safe than necessarily to target an ideological group by going after a product, gun owners, guns in this case, because you'll end up hurting your own political base if you assume that those people, or, you know, if you, if you assume that urban women of color are actually more likely to vote for you 
than to vote for someone you could you perceived as an opponent. So that's a big implication right there. It's no longer safe to target a good uh, if you want to punish an enemy in this case. Yeah, I think that's that's one of the significant political impacts of something like this. If, if there are more gun owners in your uh, your constituency than maybe you realized previously, then that as a politician, you may change the way that you look at the issue. Right. I mean, I guess that's that's sort of the idea there. Right. Well, it should be. I mean, now you've got to deal with it, um, ideally, at, at least on a policy basis, a true policy basis. Is it really a social ill? Um, is it something there, if you legislate on, it's going to harm members of your own constituency, and not those, not just those who would not necessarily vote for you? Um, ideally, it should help to spur politicians in that direction. And maybe it will. We'll see how well that's digested as the uh, changes in the nature of firearms owners becomes more widely accepted and the fact that it doesn't look the way now that it did 10 years ago. Yeah. Another implication of this, of course, is that if you're understanding firearms ownership, one of the assumptions for years, at least in certain circles, was that the ranks of gun owners have been shrinking slowly but steadily over the last 30 years or so. Yeah. That may not be true. Um, it looks as if, you know, polling depends, you know, the general social survey, for instance, finds, I think, that about 20 percent of Americans, at least it claims 20 percent of Americans own guns, about 30 percent live in a gun owning household. That's about the lowest end survey you'll find. But the general social survey is also conducted by going door to door, knocking on doors and having a stranger say, do you engage in a politically fraught and sometimes socially frowned upon activity? I mean, if someone knocks on your door and says, hey, are you a heroin user? Whether or not you are, you're probably going to say no. And you're getting that same phenomenon, I would think, in many cases on these surveys. So it probably is not safe to assume that there's any handle at all on how prevalent gun ownership is, let alone that it's necessarily a shrinking phenomenon in the country, especially after, what, five years of surging gun sales. Yeah, yeah. And, and to the credit of these researchers, I think, they did seem uh, to acknowledge multiple parts of what you were just talking about there and, and, and bond herself, uh, said there's, there's probably a need to change the way that researchers actually approach studying this issue. Uh, she said, she told me, quote, this is one of the studies that should hit researchers. Maybe we need to start adjusting the way we we're asking questions. We can't always put in, I put it on participants to be 100% honest all the time if we haven't created environments in which they feel comfortable doing that, if we haven't interacted with communities in a way that makes us trustworthy. My hope for this piece uh, is that it nudges researchers to start thinking about how they can engage with folks on firearms to help advance research and also give back to the community that we're studying. So on that topic, what, what do you think it is that's um, driving people not to want to share? And, you know, you get into it a little bit there. There's sort of a, a negative social um, stigma to gun ownership in certain communities. Do you think that's the full explanation or do you see uh, potentially more to it than that? Well, the researchers themselves speculated. They said that a lot of people um, may not trust that the survey results will not be shared with government. That means that if they say, yes, I own a gun and uh, the government decides that it's going to change policy and criminalize the ownership of a firearm, they then may be targeted. So lack of trust in a stranger on the phone or a stranger at the door is going to be part of it. That's going to be hard to address. Um, another part, of course, is that, uh, yes, you've got you know, a lot of the new gun owners are in communities that traditionally are considered to be uh, restrictive to guns, uh, certainly, and culturally unfriendly to guns, I would say, in many, many cases. So they may not want that shared. But also, universities now are perceived and academic researchers as almost all being on the political left and therefore presumptively unfriendly to gun ownership. So if someone calls you on the phone, says, I'm from the University of whatever, um, I'd like to ask you about gun ownership. Most people, I think, at this point are going to assume that the person on the phone has a preconceived notion about gun ownership, has set ideas about it, is unfriendly to the whole concept, and they're probably going to respond accordingly. This, of course, has big implications for the larger picture beyond firearms. As universities have become more politicized, as uh, people have become less trustful in government, social trust now is at rock bottom levels across the board, not just in institutions, but between Americans with each other. Um, people perceive hostility from other groups, from the government and from institutions that they consider alien. 
it's going to be very hard to fix survey results uh, based on traditional research methods. Uh, they're going to have to devise something that's entirely different in order to build trust before you then start asking about sensitive issues. And they still may not find an easy fix for this. I don't see how you do that in any kind of a, a cheap way without actually entering the community, setting up shop and becoming part of that community. Uh, but there are huge implications from these findings. Yeah, I mean, the researchers themselves did point out a number of different motivations that they thought people could have, uh, especially in these different groups that they identified. Uh, one of the, you know, and some of them that you've gone over there, like they perhaps live in a more liberal area where gun ownership is frowned upon. Um, you know, they, they may distrust um, academic institutions like Rutgers, like a, an institution that uh, I think a, a lot of the gun rights uh, activists would probably distrust this this uh, institution that produced this study, to be completely frank. Um, and, and so they thought that could be a motivation. And then, you know, uh, minority communities may have a distrust of authority figures for a totally different reason than gun rights activists do, you know, if that makes sense. Like oh, absolutely, yes. The same level of mistrust, but it comes from very different places. Um, and, the, and they noted all of that to their credit in their in their write-up. Um, and, uh, you know, it is something that I think is going to be difficult to overcome. And it does have such, it's, it's interesting, you know, how, how do you move forward as a writer, as somebody who analyzes these things um, with this knowledge that there is, I mean, you know, this was something we assumed perhaps, right, for a long time, but now there's a study that's quantifying it to some degree. And the, and the I mean, the amount that they put on it, right, is it's almost half the people that said they don't own guns that fit the model, at least to, uh, to a certain threshold for people who do own guns. So, you know, th that's a huge discrepancy that would put the number would rocket it up from something like 33% into the 60 percentage range. So, uh, I mean, you know, how, how do you, as, as an analyst, as a writer, <laughs> move forward with this sort of, information that perhaps is the, all, all this information we're seeing is is not as reliable as we might have thought it was. I, I think I incorporated into a big problem overall in polling, but also in the social sciences. Um, there's what's called a replication crisis in the social sciences and has been now for about 20 years. What it comes down to is that psychology, sociology, anthropology, if you look at studies that are supposed to be evidence for any conclusion, and then you go out and you take the same study and you try to get results that resemble those results to, um, that were first achieved, you can't very often. Um, in more than half the cases, studies can't be replicated. They produce results that are wildly at odds with the original study. I think what we're going to find is that a lot of the surveys of things about guns, but also anything else that might be politically or legally fraught, are simply untrustworthy. Uh, we're going to have a replication crisis that extends into more areas. So this isn't a, a something that exists in isolation. What it means is that researching a population, especially a distrustful population, and the pop American population is distrustful and probably growing increasingly so, um, that researching this population is going to be very difficult. Political polling, notoriously inaccurate in recent years and growing more so, might be fixable in some ways, but I know that I hang up on political pollsters, and I think a lot of people do. So I write about it as a phenomenon, knowing that the data that I read in studies is often unreliable. I don't mention that in my writing as often as I should. I think there's an illusion of certainty sometimes when we read something that's written in academic language that has numbers with decimal points after it. These numbers aren't anywhere near as reliable as we often pretend. And I, I often then come across results on the same issue that are wildly at odds with the first research paper. And that really should clue us in that these studies um, aren't as reliable as we'd like them to be. This gun study, the idea that um, we don't have a handle on how many gun owners there are, is part of this larger issue. We have to, and we have to address that, that there's a wide range of uncertainty and that a lot of that is deliberate. A lot of people don't want to be tagged and identified. They don't trust the people asking them questions and they're not going to make it easy on researchers, on pollsters, on surveyors until trust is re-earned, which it probably will not be in the near future. So other research methods will have to be developed or just as likely we'll have to live in a world of uncertainty. I mean, that's a pretty... Uh that's that's pretty um, stark, right? Um, conclusion to draw. Uh, you know, certainly poll, polling has had 
significant issues. You know, we saw that in the, uh, I think most acutely in um, with the underpolling of Trump supporters and perhaps the 2016 elections, um, uh, you know, but pollsters had largely adopted strategies to deal with that and they were better in, um, you know, 2020 and, and then perhaps maybe even overestimating um, Republican support in 2024. Uh, you know, I just I, I wonder, like, what, so what are you what were you go to from here? Just anec- anecdotal evidence all the time. That doesn't seem like a much better uh, approach, right? It, it's not. I mean, we have to survey. We have to poll. But we also have to be yeah. aware of our limitations. Um, hmm. So put the numbers out there, make the phone calls, but also be aware that you're going to have people lying to you, that you're going to have people hanging up on you. And that the results you get in the end, despite the decimal points after the number, um, don't represent reality as closely or as reliably as we'd like it to be. If it's on the nose, it's an accident. Um, And these could help us to guide us. Um, They can give us an idea of what's going on, but they're not precise. And uh, the world that exists around us is going to continue to be resistant to analysis. Doesn't mean it can't be analyzed, but it's it can't be quantified quite so precisely as we'd like it to be. And in this case, the percentage of gun owners in the United States is probably a lot higher than 30 percent. Is it going to be lower than 100 percent? Certainly. But that gives us a much, much wider range with which to work than we thought we had before. We just know that. A lot of Americans are gun owners and they own a lot of guns and getting a better handle on that is going to be a challenge going forward. Yeah, certainly. I th- I, you know, that, that makes a lot of sense to me in terms of, you know, the, uh, polling is useful. Studies are useful. Scrutiny of them is also important, though, uh, for the reasons you laid out there um, and for the reasons that this study makes clear. You know, it's a, there is a tendency, I think, on uh, to either, you know, people like to go to the extremes on things often on things oftentimes where it's either, you know, scientific study of this is totally perfect and without question, or it's completely useless and, um, and shouldn't be looked at at all. And I think there's a, you know, obviously a middle ground in there that makes a lot more sense. And, um, uh, as I'm sure you agree. And, and, you know, cause, uh, what, there's, uh, I guess there's, um, you know, there's the, the more, um, What's the right way to say this? There's the more ex- sensational aspect to this study where they found that the numbers, you know, maybe half the people who said they didn't own guns really did. Um, and then there's the more modest outcome where they raised the bar for what they con- considered, you know, somebody who was likely a gun owner from, you know, having 50 percent um, probability or 75 percent probability and there they were, it was still significant miss, right? It was still like 10% of people saying right. they didn't own guns when they really did. But the only thing that, uh, you know, I would take away from that is, um, you know, there, there is a way to look at this study and find it somewhere in, within what polling has shown us, right? Because they, they started from 33% of people openly admitting they own guns to the pollsters, um, which is pretty in line with what you see from Gallup and Pew and the Associated Press and some of the other group, major pollsters that ask this question on a regular basis. And then if you add that 10% or so, uh, I think it was a little more than 10%, you know, for the more conservative estimation of how many people are, are not necessarily openly admitting they're going to be gun owners, but probably do own a gun, um, you know, you get somewhere in the 40 percentage range, somewhere in the mid 40 percent. And that's what you'll find with pollsters who ask the question, does does somebody in your home own a gun? Do you have a a gun in your home? And so the other more modest explanation, I guess, would be that perhaps the people are saying no when they're asked if they own a gun, don't consider themselves to be gun owners, but are people who live with gun owners, right? The a wife whose husband owns a gun might not consider herself a, a gun owner, but there's a gun in her home, right? Um, and, and so that's the only, that's the other explanation that you could go, you know, there's, there's the explanation that we're wildly off with how many people really own a gun. Uh, and then there's the explanation that what, what this is really showing us is just that difference between people who 
consider some, themselves gun owners and people who have a gun in their home because they're going to be demographically similar to their, you know, a wife is going to be demographically similar to her husband in a lot of ways, most likely. What do you think of that possibility? Yeah, I mean, that range of possibility is certainly going to be helpful. And yes, a spouse of a gun owner is probably going to have similar attitudes and responses to a survey as an actual gun owner. Uh, in this case, though, remember that half of those, almost half of those they identified as probable gun owners falsely saying they are not gun owners are unmarried urban women of color. So That's true. They're not going to have, um, they, may, they may have a partner, but they're going to have a lower likelihood of having a household where somebody else is the gun owner and they simply share the attitudes. Um, so you probably have a fairly high percentage of those that actually are gun owners falsely answering the survey. But your, your larger point, is, I think I agree with entirely, which is that this at least points us in a direction. It gives us ranges with, uh, to work with. And if we don't demand precision, if we simply if we want to know, OK, what's the general thrust? I think this tells us, OK, gun ownership is not shrinking. Um, it's probably expanding and it's expanding into areas of the population that were previously not considered to have a high likelihood um, of engaging in gun ownership. So that points to, to other research areas, which is why. And uh, also, why are they resistant to being surveyed? Uh, there's some speculation as to that in the research, but that's speculation. Uh, and, I, and I think that, that we'll probably see them following that up in the future to find out why are they so privacy oriented. Um, let's find, let's kind of narrow that down and see if there's a way to get a better handle on that. And if there are implications from that for uh, policymaking, for politics, um, and also, of course, for research methods. Yeah. And what do you make of the fact that it seems as though the the majority of people they identified as reluctant to, um, you know, disclose their gun ownership are the, these sort of gun culture 2.0 type owners. You know, the minorities, they're women, they're more urban, they live in more urban areas. That's that's your um, your more modern gun owner, uh, the less stereotypical gun owner that, you know, perhaps a lot of people picture when they think of a gun. Owner. The stereotype is, you know, an old white guy who lives out in the country and, sh and likes to hunt. It's Elmer Fudd, basically, yeah. right? Um, and we've known for a while now that that's not um, representative of, of your average gun owner anymore, especially people who are becoming gun owners for the first time, uh, especially during the pandemic, since the pandemic. And so, you know, what do you make of the fact that that group appears to be even more resistant, <laughs> perhaps, to uh, sharing with researchers that they own guns than uh, you know, your old, your uncle who, who has an NRA hat or something. Well, it has interesting implications for policy and for law. I mean, it tells us that I'm not surprised that, for instance, that urban areas might be culturally and politically unfriendly to gun ownership. I'm a former New Yorker myself. Um, I owned a gun in New York. I was able to get a pistol permit, which took some jumping through hoops. Uh, but yeah. I also knew that um, owning a gun in New York was frowned upon by a lot of people. So I didn't talk about it a lot. So I'm not at all surprised that someone living in an urban environment surrounded by people who are culturally resistant to firearms ownership, where um, the law is restrictive and we're running afoul of the law might be a matter of interpretation, would be would not want to advertise the fact that they have now joined the ranks of gun owners. Um, it might cause problems with the neighbors, might cause problems with the police. Even if you're not breaking the law, maybe they knock on the door. Who wants that? So it, uh, it points to an expanding uh, population of gun owners. We already know that about 2.9% of Americans became new gun owners during uh, the pandemic and since. That adds up to, I think, uh, 7 million households, 5 million new individual gun owners, something like that. It's actually more than that. Uh, so it's expanding population. And we know that a lot of them are women and minorities. So that means it's expanding into new directions, and that includes cities. That has big implications now for policy, politics, research. I mentioned earlier that it means you cannot safely target an ideological or partisan community now by legislating on guns because you may end up hurting your own constituency if they've become quiet gun owners. So we have to be more careful of that. Uh, that's, I think, a good thing. I don't think that laws ought to be used as political weapons. Um, I think that if you want to pass laws, whether or not I approve of those laws, they should be passed on their own merits and not as a means of tormenting your enemies. So that is uh, probably a good outcome. 
Uh, it also means that uh, urbanites are probably better armed than we've assumed in the past. Uh, New York has long admitted that they have no idea how many New Yorkers own guns. Well, a lot more than they thought. Uh, and that's going to be true of Chicago, San Francisco, um, you know, Atlanta, cities across the country. So it has big uh, implications for politics, um, for law, and it may well change the culture in the cities. If all of a sudden you, you, you accidentally find out that your neighbor also is a quiet gun owner and you start talking about it and more people talk about it, that's going to shift the culture. So that's going to have implications in the future as to maybe narrowing that divide between uh, rural and urban culture, at least on this issue, maybe not in other issues. So there's a lot that could come out of this. It really points to some interesting research directions, um, both for now and also for the future. Yeah, yeah, no, certainly. And uh, you can even look at it as one more piece of evidence that there is a shift in gun culture. Um, and the, the, the thing that makes me wonder is perhaps when we're going to see the practical effects of that. You know, I think we've there's been a lot of discussion since 2020 about how this uh, these new um, gun owners who look and vote differently, at least at the demographic level, obviously not, you know, people are individuals. They don't just because they're a certain race or they live in a certain right. area doesn't mean they all think the same thing. But, um, you know, on a demographic scale, you know, there's been a lot of expectation that people are going to eventually shift how they vote based on the fact that they own guns. Some people thought that was going to happen, you know, immediately. And I, I thought that was unrealistic at the time. You know, they, just because you bought a gun doesn't mean you're going to switch from, either not voting or voting Democratic to being a, a party line Trump voter. That doesn't seem very realistic, right? But presumably over the long term, it'll have some impact, um, maybe primarily in the Democratic Party. Uh, but I don't know that we've seen that yet, right? I mean, we've, we've seen a lot, if anything, the Democratic Party has moved to the left on the issue yeah. over the last five years or so. Um, so when, you know, what's your take on when we should expect to see that practical impact? Well, I mean, we've seen a shakeup of the Democratic Party in recent years where the party has um, become, I think, more representative of well-educated urban elites. And what we're talking about is more uh, working class urbanites who probably at this moment don't have as much uh, clout in the Democrat par in Democratic Party as they might have in the past, but may have more in the future. Um, it's been said before that politics is downstream of culture, and that's going to take a while. If the Democrats find that relying upon yuppies, for want of a better word, is insufficient to maintain uh, their advantage in urban areas um, or a national politics, they're going to have to incorporate, once again, more members of minority working class communities um, in their base, more candidates from those communities. And those candidates, you're probably going to see them reflecting the attitudes of their communities. That doesn't mean they're going to change their minds on economics, on foreign policy. But I wouldn't be surprised if slowly they simply stop talking about gun, uh, gun issues, gun policy, stop voting quietly for it. And then eventually, not quickly, 10, 20 years down the future, you'll have once again um, minority urban uh, working class candidates who are pro-gun representing everything else in, you know, on, the, on the left side you know, left side of the political spectrum in terms of policies, but uh, not, not leaving that to the, uh, the right-leaning party anymore. Hmm. Okay, interesting. Well, obviously, we'll have to keep an eye out on, on that uh, development for quite a long time, I guess. But uh, I think it's probably the more realistic view of, of how things really change uh, and, and that it does take a while for things to trickle down from uh, cultural shift to a political shift. But uh, but that's why we'll probably have to have you on again in the future to keep uh, discussing these things as they come up, um, as we get more signs of that change. Uh, or if we don't. And we'll or have if to we don't. figure out why. Yes. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, we appreciate you being on. We appreciate you giving us your insight into this study and, and some of the implications of it. Can you tell people a little bit more about where they can find your writing if they want to Read more. Absolutely. I write uh, three columns a week for Reason.com, which is the online edition of Reason magazine. And my columns are also sent out in the Rattler, which is a three times a week uh, email newsletter. Doesn't cost anything. Go on in, sign up, start to hate me and unsubscribe. That doesn't cost anything either. And I have a uh, lifestyle column in the print edition of Reason magazine, every other issue. So come and look for me at Reason.com. And I uh, hope you find something you enjoy reading. All right. Wonderful. Well, appreciate you being with us. 
And uh, we'll have to have you back on again in the future. Thanks, right now man. we're going to head on. Yeah, absolutely. Right now we're going to head on over to our uh, news update. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the weekly news update. I'm contributing writer Jake Fogelman, joined, of course, by Reload founder Stephen Gutowski. How are we doing this week, Steve? I'm doing all right, Jake. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Pretty good. Can't complain. Pretty good. Nice. Um, you know, I think before we get started with the news, we could probably update people on how that range day went with uh, the National Journalism Center. It teased it last week on the show, but it, we recorded right before I actually went and did the range day uh, out at uh, X Cows, this fancy new range here in Northern Virginia. It's a little bit further away, but it's very nice. Very, it's like a gym, like a CrossFit gym sort of deal, and then also a, a high end gun range. Um, and it was, I was very impressed. Yeah, they from the pictures. Nice, I say from the pictures, it looked very nice. <laughs> yeah, it, it was. It was super nice. Um, so I might have to go out there more often. It's a little far away from me. It's maybe you know just under an hour away, but, uh, and I have a range that's about 10 minutes away from my apartment. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, sharpshooters, which is one I usually go to, but, uh, Excal is, is pretty impressive. And I think guns out TV, we've written about them in the past. Those guys, John and sure, Michael, they're having a whole event out there next month. So, uh, I might have to go to that uh, with a bunch of other like gun people. I think, uh, Iraq better in 8888 is going to be there. And, a number of other gun tubers and stuff. So I don't know. I was impressed by the range. Regardless, <laughs> I was also impressed by the interns, right? So National Journalism Center, it's, it's a project of the Young America's Foundation, and they train, you know, up and coming college students to be reporters here in DC, the DC area. And uh, in fact, our intern, Stephen Bowl, is from this program. Um, and so he's been really great so far for us. Uh, you know, he kind of comes from more of a sports reporting background. So trying to get him to do more of the, uh, give him the opportunities to do, uh, you know, sh sports shooting, because that's sort of in the same vein. Uh, he's actually working on some, uh, a really good story that we should have up for you guys in the near future. But, um, you know, it was actually his first time shooting a gun from what I understand from what he said. So, uh, it gave him and these other interns a, hands-on real world experience with firearms. Some of them had a little bit of shooting experience. Uh, one or two of them were, you know, kind of gun people, right? They, they own guns. They knew a bit more uh, about it, but most of them didn't have much experience with firearms. And so this was, uh, I think an important step for them to get a little bit of practical experience with, uh, with guns, if they're going to be reporting on it, you know, that's pretty important, right? Sure. Absolutely. I think it's, uh, it's, well, first of all, I'm curious, did, did Steven or any of the other interns give you any feedback about the, for those that it was their first time, did you get any feedback about their experience shooting guns? I'm always curious to hear after first timers get a, a taste of it. Yeah. They, uh, you know, uh, it was all positive from uh, everything that they told me. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people are excited to try guns for the first time in that sort of environment with, with trainers. Right. And I'm a certified firearms instructor. We had the range itself provided instructors. Um, and, and so it was, a, it was a very safe environment for them to try firearms for the first time to actually understand how they operate. And this is sure. a common problem that you see in media reporting. It's just a lack of information, a lack of knowledge about the subject from the, even the base level uh, stuff about how firearms function. Uh, and then of course, we also spent a lot of time in the classroom talking about not just how firearms function, but also how they, uh, the, the laws that govern them, the politics surrounding them, even super basic stuff like terminology, right? The difference between semi-automatic and fully automatic. Uh, yeah. Anyone who's followed media for long enough, read enough reports involving uh, firearms has seen that mistake made probably yep. numerous times. It still happens to this day, yep. <laughs> even though it's probably the most basic piece of information you could have about how a firearm works um, in 2023, you still see that mistake all the time. So, you know, we gave them that basic level foundational information. We explained how the background check system works, you know, different laws that govern gun carry, the different debates that are going on uh, surrounding those topics. And so, you know, it, it was a pretty, pretty um, significant information dump, I think for them, you know, they, they took in a lot of information. Um, and, and, uh, there were a lot of people were very engaged with that and asking questions and 
and seem to learn a good amount from it. So, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll carry through if these interns go on to become professional, you know, reporters down the line. And, uh, you know, that's the hope with this whole program, right, is to try and, and uh, improve the base level knowledge of reporters in the industry. That's something that I've spent a lot of my career trying to to work towards. And so this is part of that for me. Yeah, certainly. It sounds like it was a, a pretty good primer in the world of gun politics and policy and how to, if you're going to, like you said, if you're going to wind up one day, even if you're a, a general assignment reporter and, and something comes across your desk dealing with guns, at least you know the basics now and you, you won't make those mistakes that catch folks like yours and I's eye when we, we read a story and they mix up, they fudge different terminology. So that's great. That's great that, yep. that everyone had a good time doing that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, looking forward to continuing this program with NJC and, you know, hopefully maybe down the line I can expand it to help other uh, newsrooms, people who are already established reporters. I'm always interested in helping in any way that, that I can to just improve the general quality of firearms reporting uh, sure. in, in the United States. And, and so I'm always looking for opportunities to do that. And, and maybe we'll see something like that in the future. But uh, yeah, we got a bunch of news in addition to uh, that little update about the range day. What, uh, what's on the docket? Yeah, speaking of firearms reporting, so the first one we're going to kick off comes to us from one of our newsletter links. Uh, it's reported over at The Trace about the latest legal saga with the NRA and their ongoing uh, litigation with Ackerman McQueen. Uh, there's a new lawsuit that's sort of kind of flown under the radar to this point that The Trace reported on. Yeah, flown under the radar because it's sealed. It's secret. Right. Yeah, they're, they're keeping hush hush about it. And, and they wouldn't even talk to, I, I believe, Will, Will Van Zant was the reporter that uh, did this story and he tried to reach out to both parties and neither of them wanted to talk and it's very hush hush at this point but yeah i mean like i'm not surprised that the nra wouldn't want to talk to a reporter from the trace sure um, but at the same time it is a bit odd that this lawsuit that the judge in this case has allowed this lawsuit to be completely secret uh, and it was only it was only discovered because uh will Van Sant uh, did some good reporting, I guess, and came. he was following a different lawsuit that involves um, the wife of Tony Macris, who's a key player in the NRA Akram McQueen dispute. Uh, and she was complaining about this lawsuit that there was no records of. And so, um, you know, that that's the only way this even came to light. You know, the Akram McQueen was the former top contractor for the NRA for decades, right, accused of all sorts of um self-dealing and corruption it was a big part of what's going on with the legal case against NRA's leadership. Um, you know, they had a big breakup in 2019 when the whole internal turmoil exploded out into the public. Um, and uh, they had a big $50 million, each side was claiming $50 million worth of damages lawsuits that got settled, got settled without uh, any public information on how much was paid one direction or the other. It seems as though the NRA had to pay Ackerman, but we don't know how much that's all sealed. The NRA doesn't share this information even with their members. So um, I'm not terribly surprised that they're involved in another secret lawsuit that they won't share with their own membership or even probably members of the board, I would imagine. Um, not all members of the board, at least. And so uh, it's just another another saga over there at the NRA. Things um, you know aren't going very well as of late for them. Of course, they've lost a lot of membership, probably in large part due to these scandals um, that have uh, come out again uh, in their in their history here. So we'll keep on top of that though, and see if any information does make it to public. If anybody has any information, feel free to share it with me. Um, we'll take a look at it, what the heck this second lawsuit is about. Uh, I think NRA and members deserve to know, but uh, I'm not. Uh, but, yeah, we'll, we'll keep on top of it for the at the very least here. Sure. Yeah. Just another legal battle and another legal case for them. And uh, it's adding to a, a pile of many. Uh, but speaking of legal cases, uh, we have a story about the ATF uh, unsuccessfully asking the Fifth Circuit to stay a decision from a lower court in Texas to vacate their rule on unfinished firearm frames and receivers. 
Um, that, of course, was tossed because the judge said the ATF exceeded its authority in interpreting firearms, reinterpreting firearms, pardon me. And the Fifth Circuit said, you know, we're not going to put that on hold uh, because we don't think the ATF is likely to succeed on its merits. And by doing so, it essentially just reverts back to how things were for the last 50 plus years. So it's not exactly a irreparable harm if we don't stay it. And uh, it's a big loss for the ATF, certainly. It is. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they didn't even get a, a stay pending appeal. So right, uh, it's pretty, right. pretty clear which way this Fifth Circuit is likely to rule in the end, um, this appeals panel. And so because of that, uh, this is actually an update that's not in the story, but because of that, um, the, you know, cause this just, this just happened. The, the DOJ or ATF has appealed that denial, uh, and now is, is hoping for the Supreme court itself to step in, uh, and grant a stay or to take up the case, um, in, directly. So they're trying to skip over the fifth circuit and get the Supreme Court to issue uh, a stay. Uh, we'll see, we'll have to see how that goes. You know, we've seen this a couple of times with uh, plaintiffs in gun rights cases in the uh, the Illinois assault weapons ban case and the New York gun carry law case. They both uh, attempted emergency appeals to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said no in both cases, uh, preferring to let the lower courts work out the you know build out the merits of the case build out the case law before taking any potential appeals um we'll see how the court reacts to this it is a bit different when the government appeals and the government tends to get preferential treatment in these cases frankly i mean you can see that in um rahimi right the case that the supreme court has taken up now uh, that was a doj appeal um that skipped over uh, an en banc, I believe it skipped over the en banc process in the Fifth Circuit, I'm, although I might be misremembered. Do you remember, did they go the, the en banc in Rahimi? No, you know, it was I, just a panel. It was I believe panel. it was just a panel decision, yeah. yeah. So they skipped over the en banc to go straight to the Supreme Court. Uh, en banc is where the whole court, the whole appeals court hears it, like 13 judges. But um, yeah, so it, I don't know. We'll see how the Supreme Court comes down maybe they maybe they do grant this because the government's requesting it maybe they don't because it's hard to imagine this supreme court agreeing with the atf on its rule but we will have to wait and see and we'll certainly keep track of that one too absolutely yeah this this has the makings to be a potentially very big story as you pointed out mm -hmm. because i don't think the supreme court is particularly sympathetic to broad reaching administrative rules like this yeah but the that's the other time, thing about it it's not even a second amendment case Right, uh, right. Th this is all about the Administrative Procedures Act and the rule of lenity and you know th things of that nature, those legal principles rather than the Second Amendment. So that's that's another sort of interesting twist to the, the ghost gun uh, case. But yeah, like, like you said, we'll keep on top of that. Um, but our next story that you wrote about is also related to the DOJ because we have some ongoing developments in the Hunter Biden saga and his alleged misdeeds with firearms and deals being you know off the table back on the table it's sort of been a little bit of a roller coaster ride over the last few days but you wrote a, a story about that yeah it was pretty wild uh usually so hunter biden went into court for his plea agreement to finalize it to submit it to the judge usually my understanding is that those proceedings are very um by the book and short right you just ask if everyone understands the terms, everybody says yes, and the judge takes the plea and it's over. Uh, this time they went in there and the judge asked some fairly basic questions about the scope of the uh, immunity at play in this deal and also the details of the the pretrial or the, the diversion program that Hunter Biden would be subjected to instead of being charged with a felony for possession of a gun while being uh, uh, addicted to drugs um, and didn't get the answer she wanted. And it turned out that the parties were really not on the same page at all about how much protection this deal actually gives Hunter Biden from you know future prosecution on you know over different charges stemming from some of these some of these details, some of these fa the facts of this plea deal. So uh, that was pretty remarkable. You know, it sort of blew up the whole deal. They, um, 
went into a recess to talk, each side talked to each other. Uh, the Biden's lawyers threatened to blow up the whole thing, rip it up. Uh, at one point, according to reporters who were in the, the courtroom, they they came back and uh, I guess had agreed to some sort of uh, deal, but the judge wasn't prepared to accept the the outcome of that short discussion. And is, so now the, the Hunter Biden pleaded not guilty to those two tax charges that were part of this deal. And um, they have 30 days to submit briefs explaining, you know, that they're both on the same page and why this deal is structured the way it is and, and whether that's, uh, you know, acceptable under the law. So it really got a lot of scrutiny um, in a situation where most people, I think, expected it to go through pretty fast. But we, the story we did was about the actual plea deal itself because the Politico published the actual written plea agreement, and in there was were the details of the diversion program, right? And and there was a couple of interesting things. There was mostly what's been reported, but we hadn't actually seen the written details before. And there were a couple of interesting things. Uh, you know, he, one he is. This would be a twenty-four month diversion programs so is almost like being on probation for 24 months. Like he can't, he can't do drugs. He has to be drug tested. He can't, he has to get a job. He has to do all, you know, all this stuff you might expect from a sort of plea deal agreement. Um, but also he can't own guns ever again for the rest of his life. He has to agree to have a record entered into Nick's basically uh, that would have him denied if he ever tried to go buy a gun from a gun store. Um, and he has to surrender all any guns that he has. And so, uh, and then he had to stipulate to all of these, uh, state, the statement of fact, which detailed his drug use from 2016 through 2019. And it detailed, um, that he was in possession of this gun while being a, a drug user and talked about a, a situation where he was pulled over and the gun was found in his car alongside paraphernalia for smoking crack. Um, he also had to interest. One of the interesting things is that he's, he's only being threatened with charges for the possession of the gun while being a drug user, not for lying on the background check to obtain the gun in the first place. Cause there's a question on the background check that says, you know, are you a drug? Are you addicted to drugs? And he said, no, which was a lie. And he had to stipulate to that in this statement of facts. He had to basically agree that he lied on that background check, but they didn't actually put tack that on as an additional charge. Now, I did talk to a uh, former prosecutor and uh, um, current uh, co-host. He's a defense attorney now, and he's a co-host of uh, Serious Trouble, which is a legal podcast. Uh, Ken White is his name. We had him on the podcast to talk about this exact issue not that long ago, right? And, uh, and he said that wasn't necessarily that surprising um, because the outcome would have been basically the same, it's sort of the same, just sort of a uh, six one way half a dozen the other kind of situation like he it's not like he got off for this crime he just agreed to plead to the other crime which is also probably more provable because the background check lie you have to prove that their state of mind while they were filling out the background check uh, so that's one explanation for what's going on there and um you know it's a pretty fascinating situation especially the backdrop against the political aspect of all of it yeah, certainly. And uh, it's funny, you know, we, we had a, a brief moment there. Obviously, this is sort of the final outcome. We're expecting this to sort of be the final outcome, This the terms of the deal as they've been released. Yeah, I but, think it'll still go through. Right. But it, it was funny because for a brief moment there when, you know, his lawyers were threatening to blow everything up, we thought, oh, we might possibly get that Second Amendment Hunter Biden case after all, where he fights his charges and has to <laughs> raise the Bruin defense. And it, that could have been a, a, a huge political story. Well, that could still happen. I mean, it's most likely, it seems like they're going to come to some sort of agreement. Um, maybe he gets a little bit more limited protections as far as charges against, involving crimes that weren't, weren't directly addressed in this plea deal. Sure. But it's not, it's not like a foredrawn conclusion that that's going to happen. He might still have to actually fight these charges, which would create the situation you're talking about, <laughs> which would be just... Um, incredible right it's the president's son fighting his doj um with a second amendment defense claim that right. is 
not far fetched, actually, right? right. Because uh, there have been several cases already since Bruin came down where this exact crime has been tossed out as unconstitutional. Several judges have said this provision of federal law that he's charged under, and actually the judge in this plea deal brought this up, uh, that this is constitutionally questionable provision that he's that he's agreeing to. Um, sure. So I don't know. We might still get that. It would be, uh, you know, political reporters, uh, you know, um, uh, dream, I guess, as right. far as like the drama of it all. But um, yeah, what a bizarre situation that would be, uh, especially because obviously the President Biden uh, is a staunch gun control advocate and he's already being criticized for his son getting uh, you know, no jail time for this deal that includes a felony gun charge. Right. Uh, so to see, uh, you know, we, we there could be it's not outside of the realm of possibilities. I don't think it's the most likely thing to happen, but it's not impossible that we get a U.S. v. Biden Supreme Court case precedent that expands the reach of the Second Amendment. Yeah, which would be <laughs> incredible. Like you said, that'd be quite the story. Uh, yeah. But- We'll have to follow it as it goes. Like you said, we still have a few, I think, 30 days for the lawyers to kind of hash this thing out and we'll see where yeah. the next steps go. But uh, it's definitely something for us to keep an eye on. And we we will do that. Um, but our last What's story, our last today, story? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, it gets us to um, the ongoing saga in New York, uh, where a local outlet out there called The City did some digging into uh, how the NYPD is currently handling gun permits and found that they appear to be, at least, sitting on a lot of permits and slow walking them because the approval rate is well below what it was before Bruin was decided, before the Supreme Court tossed their permitting law. So uh, it looks like that they are sitting on people's permitting applications, even as more and more people are applying for permits. It's just like classic New York official thing to do, right? Like NYPD just disregarding the Supreme Court's ruling altogether and issuing fewer permits at a lower rate than they did before the Supreme Court struck down the state's gun carry permitting law for being too restrictive. Right. Right? That, it's just amazing because you look at it and I did an analysis piece on this, uh, you know, combine that with the, the, the state's Bruin response law, sure. where they're basically just doing what the Supreme Court told them they can't do, right? With, right. In terms of sensitive places, they just try to make all of New York a sensitive place when the Supreme Court's already explicitly said you can't do that. <laughs> and, you know, now the NYPD is, uh, you know, just freezing these applications for no good reason. You know, it's not like they denied a bunch of them, right? As you as you alluded to there, that the denial rate didn't go up. In fact, the denial rate was, was very low for 2022, all right, the year that Bruin happened. But they just stopped making decisions, even though state law requires them to do it right uh, within, you know, uh, I think it was two months is the period they have to make these decisions. And they just blow through that because they just don't want to issue the permits. And um, I'm pretty sure that's not going to be a acceptable (laughs) reasoning if this makes its way up to the Supreme Court. I mean, I just think this is. This is another attempt by New York officials to just ignore what happened in Bruin. And it's really weird to watch them play this out strategically because it just seems like they're begging for another Supreme Court case. I was just about to ask. I remember shortly after the Bruin response bill was passed, you wrote an analysis piece called New York Asks Supreme Court. Thank you. May I please have another? And this seems like a, a continuation in that trend. Same idea. They're right? just begging for someone to step in and say, yeah, we already said you can't do this. So why are you know, here's another injunction or here's another, you know, they're just asking for judicial intervention for sure. It's it's such a weird thing to watch. I mean, you know, like it's not it's, we've seen this kind of reaction before. Right. You see this in cities a lot. Philadelphia does this all the time. In fact, we didn't mention it here, but I think it was in the it was in the links. Philadelphia launched another uh, like a lawsuit against gun dealers backed by every town and they're constantly passing uh, ordinances that are illegal under state law that they know aren't going to stand up when they get to court, but they do it anyway um, because they, you know, there's sort of a political benefit to it and there's no, other than wasting a lot of money, city resources, uh, 
which is a legitimate practical negative effect. Uh, beyond that, there isn't there isn't uh, any other like they're not risking arrest if they pass these right. legal yeah. ordinances or anything like that. So, I mean, I guess I mean, you know that seems to be what the New York lawmakers and law enforcement officials at large have have settled into that um, that point of view on, uh, when it comes to the Supreme Court. But that seems disastrous for the gun control movement, in my estimation, because you know think back to Washington D.C. Right. Um, Washington, D.C. had a total ban on gun carry at one point uh, that was struck down by federal judges. Then in response, instead of trying to carry that to the Supreme Court because they knew they would lose that case, they passed a law. They passed a May issue gun carry law. And then, of course, that got struck down, too. They were sort of the one of the first in line for having their uh, the, the couple of years before they were kind of the canary in the coal mine for the gun control movement of this, this sort of thing that these may issue restrictive gun carry laws weren't going to survive scrutiny anymore. And uh, instead of appealing that to the Supreme Court, right, because they, again, thought they would lose. And they were explicit about this at the time. The, the attorney general in D.C. was open about why they weren't going to appeal that decision. And it was because they thought they would lose. And that would be bad for the rest of the country, Um in areas that had the same policies. They didn't want to be responsible for setting yet another Supreme Court precedent against um, the the, uh, viewpoint of staunch gun control advocates. Uh, But New York itself seems to have absolutely no qualms about doing just that. I mean, they 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 just lost the Supreme Court last year. It's been one year, right? It's June 2022. And they've already got a case that's fast-tracked through the Second Circuit. We're just waiting on a ruling there. And it's likely that the Supreme Court is going to take that case up because you've already got two justices, two of the most influential conservative justices, who said they think that the lower court that struck down the law was did so in a thoughtful manner and that they were mostly worried about this pre- the Second Circuit taking too long to review that case. And so it's really not far. I know a lot of people in the gun rights community are are, are constantly worried that the Supreme Court's going to go back into hibernation on the Second Amendment, right? And uh, that they're just going to wait another decade before they take another substantial case. But it doesn't seem like that's how they're approaching things at this point. Uh, you know, they took Rahimi. Uh, I know that's not a case that gun rights advocates would prefer them to be to be the first follow-up to Bruin, but it is a Second Amendment case. And that's the second, that's the third Second Amendment case in three years. You know, they had the mooted one for the previous New York case that got mooted. But um, it seemed, and they, they've already spoken in this Antioch case in New York that you know, at least two justices, two of the, you know, ju- it was Thomas and Alito, and they're pretty influential justices on the court right now, that they, uh, you know, they don't, <laughs> and so not in so many words, but they basically said, we don't, we agree with the, the lower courts ruling that this law is unconstitutional. Um, and we just don't want to step on the toes of the second circuit and let them go through their process and get to their conclusion before we step in and do something. Uh, so uh, it doesn't seem, it seems more likely than not to me that New York is going to be back in front of the Supreme Court because of these laws and how they're, and also how they're, you know, enforcing them in practice. This NYPD situation will probably be at issue in that New York case when it reaches the Supreme Court, which could be as soon as next year. Certainly. And and it's worth pointing out that uh, in the piece, we noted that there actually already is a class action lawsuit being filed mm-hmm. on this very, these delay tactics with the NYPD, yeah. because there are several gun owners saying, hey, it's been months and I don't have my permit, even though the statute clearly says you don't get to take, you know, a year or 18 months to approve a permit. So that, you know, that could be its own case. Yeah, like case, you said, yep. it'll come up in the other lawsuits as well. So there's just a bunch of different I avenues. Think it, I think it'll gonna, be both. Yeah. Yeah. Like it, it'll come up as a point in the New York case against the overall law would be my guess, because there, a lot of this happened after that <laughs> New York passed its Bureau response law pretty fast. Right. Yeah. And so the, the requirements that the MIPD is judging these permits off of for most of 
the second half of 2022 were under that new law. And so uh, the practical evidence that they just didn't issue permits <laughs> will probably play a big role, especially convincing people like Kavanaugh and Roberts, because if you read that Kavanaugh Roberts concurrence, and I talk about this in the analysis piece for members, but, um, you know, they, they say, you know, uh, shall issue permitting is fine as long as it's actually shall issue permitting, because, you know, as applied challenges will be perfectly acceptable if you uh, essentially if these jurisdictions don't actually implement real shall issue policies, if they're still doing stuff like this after the law is implemented, then that can be challenged. And uh, it seems like those two justices would be on board. And I think you could bet the other four conservative justices would already be there on striking a, uh, striking actions like that down as unconstitutional. So, you know, the, the New York is kind of coming at it from all angles in terms of <laughs> getting on the wrong side of all of these conservative justices, uh, you know, regardless of how uh, conservative or moderate they may be in the, right. the spectrum of the Supreme Court. So uh, I, it's really a remarkable thing to watch from an outsider's perspective, just looking at the strategic aspects of it, because it's just sort of mind boggling how this has all unfolded to me. We'll have to see where it all heads, where it all ends up, right? I, you know, I, I can't tell the future, just just what it seems like things will, will how they'll work out. All right, yeah. It's bold strategy on their part. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bold strategy, Cotton. Um, <laughs> but we'll, we'll certainly be there to cover it. And if you want to read that analysis piece that I was alluding to there or follow the rest of our reporting or support our reporting. You can buy a membership today over at thereload.com. That is how we fund our operations here. And it is how you can best support us. But of course, if you're not ready to make that jump, you can of course sign up for our free newsletter. It comes out once a week, doesn't clog your inbox, gives you the headline news, the biggest stories in with guns in America of the week. And you will stay very well up to date just reading that by itself and hopefully you know, if you uh, uh, enjoy that enough, maybe you'll buy a membership down the line. But, but if you want to find other ways to support us, you can also like and share this podcast. You can give us a review wherever you're listening to this at. And uh, that also helps grow the show as well, which is always beneficial to the reload in the long run. So that's it for this week. We appreciate you guys tuning in and listening. And we will be back again real soon.